on the missions front, um, I, yes, I probably should actually introduce myself here, shouldn't I? For the, anyone in the room that doesn't know, I'm Claire. I'm the Compassion, Justice and Missions Pastor here at Verso. Um, and we are currently in a mission series. I think we're on week four. Um, and if you've been around, you'll know we unpacked the story of that mission is a story. It's the story of God. We've looked at the why of mission, that we are stewarding all people, every nation, tribe, and tongue to that place of gathering around the throne in worship to Jesus as we were intended from the beginning of time. And we've been looking at what does that mean for us as a church? What is God's invitation as he's been gaining our attention around mission in this hour? Um, And we've been unpacking Acts 1.8 and this framework that has birthed out of the scriptures for us to engage in mission moving forward. And so in that scripture, we've been looking at Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And last week, Mark unpacked uh, Judea and Samaria, which for our context is Nia, which is about our vineyard family globally. The, the people that are familiar to us, but they're not here on our doorstep. And so we, we launched a new partnership um, with Vineyard globally into Sri Lanka, which was a really exciting thing to share. And I know there's been lots of buzz around that. Lots of people have been really excited by what God is going to do through us as we partner together into Sri Lanka. And this morning, I have the privilege of unpacking the part of the framework that is to the ends of the earth. Now, I'm going to give you a pre-warning. I feel this message in my belly this morning, like, like it's here. It's a gut message. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try and tame my passion <laughs> slightly for you all. But let's tuck in together and see what the Lord has for us um, as we hear his heart for the ends of the earth. I want you to turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 9, verse, starting in verse 35. Maybe I'm getting too old, my, my own, but I'm like. <laughs> Matthew 39, verses 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowd, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, what is going on here in these two verses? Jesus, to state the obvious, is moving in villages and towns. He's doing what he came to do. He's fulfilling his purpose. He's telling us, telling those in those villages and towns about the good news of the gospel. And he's healing the sick and he's healing every affliction. And we immediately see a principle of the kingdom that Jesus is demonstrating because when he heals the sick and when he heals every affliction, we can think of the countless times in the Gospels where that looks like seeing the one, right? The woman that tugged on the hem of his garment, the the lame man walking, the leper that no one would touch. Jesus models looking into the eyes of the one and seeing the one and responding to them. But then we see something different here. You know, in different versions, it says, when he saw the multitude, the crowds, he had compassion for them. Interesting. Here Jesus sees the multitude. And he has compassion for them. And and that root word compassion here in this point in the Greek is a word that I will attempt to pronounce. (laughs) It's splakjizomi. That's a terrible Greek pronunciation. I apologize in advance. But it literally means to have your gut torn apart. Jesus isn't just empathetic for the multitude that he's looking at. He's not just, I feel sorry for them, which so often is our modern understanding of compassion. Oh, did you hear about that thing? Oh, my heart, yeah, just felt so sorry for them. Jesus is torn apart in the gut for who? The helpless, the people that are harassed, who are like sheep without a shepherd. He is torn up in the gut for the lost. He's torn up in the gut about it. And that tearing up, when we experience that kind of compassion, what does it do? It, you cannot help but respond. You have to engage. You have to be moved to action. In fact, a lot of scripture says he was moved to compassion.
that he was demonstrating this to his disciples. Who are we in this room? We are his disciples, the apprentices of his life. And he's showing us two principles that we need to be moved for the one. And we need to see a fresh verse, though, the multitude that are helpless and harassed and in need of Jesus. And I got to thinking about it, like, is this how I really feel about the lost? Really? Like, I love Jesus, and I, and I'm, I know in here that the lost need him. But I am I moved like this, like Jesus was for the lost? I think sometimes I like to think that's the job of the evangelist. And I don't count myself an evangelist. But I'm a disciple of Jesus. And it got me thinking, okay, Claire, well, why in this context of 2024 is it so hard for me to be moved like this? Like when I reflected on my own life. And then I started to think about just like what is forming me? We know that this forms us, right, as disciples. We know that community forms us. It helps us to become more like Jesus. But we're also aware that we live in a world that is forming us. Something is always forming us. It's just what is forming us. And I got to thinking about how the cultural stories of our time are really intriguing in this context of Jesus modeling the one and the multitude. And the first is the way that the world has formed us as a generation and idolized self. We know this, okay? I'm not telling you anything new here. We know that in our culture, independence, self-orientation, the drive for power, sex, and money, the my truth is my truth, it is the truth, what feels good is goodness. Guys, it's in direct opposition to the way of Jesus, The life we're commissioned to live is one of utter dependence on him for every single part of our life, surrendered to say that he is the Lord and King and therefore I am not. What the good life is, is a life that is living out the truth of who God is, designed for relationship and community and to see the one, the other. If we look at ourselves, we can't see the other. And then over the last 20 years or so, there's been this massive shift, right? We know this, of over-information. We have more access to the stories of the multitude of crises and problems in our world than we have ever had. And the idea of that is that we would know more and we could be moved and we could could respond. And what has this over-information actually done to us? It's desensitizing us. And in the desensitization, because we hear it, I mean, maybe it's just me that scrolls through social media and I'm like unmoved by the latest war that's broken out or the latest crisis. Maybe a little bit moved, but (laughs) I like to think I'm slightly human, but you know, we scroll and we scroll and we read and we read and we are being desensitized. And under the desensitization, what is growing is an indifference. Indifference. And it's creating the cycle back to the self again. If I just look after myself, this world will be okay. And I hate to break it to you, but indifference is as rife in the church as it is in the world. And how do I know it? Because I know it's in my life. I know it by my flippant scrolling. I know it by the fact that I've lived next to a new neighbor and I've not yet even attempted to tell my neighbor about Jesus. It's been there for four months. I've had multiple conversations. I know it's rife in the UK church because only 35% of the UK believers read their Bible every day. We're indifferent to our formation of the Bible. It's hard realities, and I I don't mean it to be condemning in any way stretch or like stretching in that sense. I just think that we need to wake up to what is forming us in this hour. 
And I'm not suggesting that we all walk out of here like mad raving evangelists and do crazy things. I want you to hear my heart in this. Because how we share the gospel is really important, and I don't have time this morning to go into all of that kind of dynamic of this. But I'm talking to our hearts here, Verso, to awaken us to see where the world is in direct opposition to the way of the kingdom and why it is so hard for us to be moved and compelled in compassion for the lost. And when we think about this in the context of this mission series and in the context of this framework, that we feel the Lord is inviting us to extend our reach even to the ends of the earth. I believe there is a multitude of people that the Lord is calling the church globally in this hour to see, to see. And it's a multitude of people like us in this room, they may have very different lives to ours, but they are helpless to knowing any differently. They are harassed with wrong understanding by a world that's forming them and breaking them and leading them to an eternity of eternal separation with Jesus. And that needs to resonate in here. And that multitude, friends, is the 3.2 billion people on this earth who have little or zero access to the gospel, the unreached. It's estimated that uh, 3.2 billion people have little or zero access to the gospel. That's 40% almost of our global population. Within that, it's estimated that about 2.5 billion of them have never, ever had the opportunity to hear the name of Jesus. They've never had the chance to accept Jesus, let alone reject him. And I heard this um, from a, a, great, a great guy that I just admire so much, Andy. Um, he said this at the send. He said, if every single Christian shared the gospel with every single person they knew in their community, their neighborhood, their workplace, everyone that they knew, There would still be two billion people alive in our world today that would not hear the gospel because no believer knows them. There's no church on their street. There's no small group trying to reach out. There's no one in their village, their workplace, their city. They have absolutely zero access to the gospel. And I can't help think that those people are deeply on the heart of God. And I want us to see it up. You can see it up here. So this map shows us the blue dots are Christians in the world. They read each dot. You can't, it's not, uh, can't see it very well on, this, on our screen, but there's dots and they represent 50,000 people. And you can see where are, this, where are the unreached? They're the red. And the blue is the Christians. And perhaps you think, well, Claire, that's wonderful. I'm not called to go to the unreached. That's the missionary's job. God calls the missionaries to go to the unreached. Well, let's look at where missionaries go. Missionaries aren't going to the unreached, people. The red dots pretty much stay the same. And I'm like, why? What is going on here? And you know why? Because to go as a missionary to the unreached is really, really, really hard. I've met missionaries who have surrendered their life to Jesus. They've upped and shipped their families, small children, to go into villages where they're the only Christian. And their church raved and they celebrated and they sent them out. And within months, the church has forgotten them. They don't write to them. They they might add them once in a while to a prayer. And before you know it, this family is in an unreached group and they are on the forefront of trying to preach the gospel to people in a radical different situation. And they are by themselves and they quit because it's just too hard. Why? Because the church hasn't had their heart broken for the unreached. And it is why, so this is for all of us. You may not feel like the Lord leads you to go to the unreached, but if the global church does not wake up to the reality of the unreached in our world, and we don't let God let it hit our guts, we will never see this map changed because it takes a whole church willing to open up our hearts and say, God, would you break our heart for the lost? And would you show me my part to play in that picture?
And I believe the Lord's been shaking the church globally. We've been talking about that. He's been shaking us. He's been refining us, right? He's been calling us back to a place of consecration, of holiness and purity of worship, getting rid of our stages and our platforms and all the things that we've been idolized within the Western church. Why? Like Mark talked about last week, because I believe as we encounter him, as we see him, we worship him, we encounter his holiness, what happens? Mark talked about it from Isaiah 6, 8. We see Jesus. We see the Father. We interact with the Holy Spirit, and our response is, oh my word, you are so good. What you have done for me is so, so unbelievable. I can't help but respond, God, move in me. Here I am, do whatever you want to do in me, move me, shape me, call me, take me. You are the Lord and I surrender because you're so good. And and guys, if you're in the room this morning and you've never heard about Jesus, I want to tell you this morning, he wants to pursue you. He loves you. He designed you in a garden to commune with him, to worship him, to be in a place with no pain, no suffering, no unrest, no hatred, no injustice. And then the story unfolded and we, our world was broken when sin entered through Adam and Eve. And here we are in this world and you might feel broken this morning, but guess what? The good news of Jesus is that he came for you, the one. And he walks into our building and he's come for all of us. All of us that have said yes to Jesus, we've tasted and we've seen his goodness. And guys, his goodness is for the whole world, for every tribe, every tongue, every people group. We don't get to be selfish with it. We get to say, holy moly, you are so good, God. We need to share it with the neighbor on next door to my house and all the way to the ends of the earth. Well, what happens here in Matthew 9 next? Verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Let's read that again. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into his harvest. I find this bit fascinating. You would think that we're supposed to pray for the lost, right? (laughs) And we should, don't get me wrong, we should. (laughs) But I love this scripture because Jesus, in the face of seeing the multitude who are lost, he says, guys, the Lord of the harvest is the Lord of the harvest. He has no doubt that when people taste and see how good he is, they're gonna say yes to him. He's not concerned that people aren't going to turn to him. You know what he's concerned about? He's concerned about his bride, you and me, the church, that we will not carry that compassion in our hearts, that we will not go. The reality of the maps that we saw can no longer sit with a few. And the Lord is stirring his church, which includes us in this room, to extend our reach, to see the multitude beyond what we see in our everyday. And he says what? To pray earnestly. And that word earnestly means not flippantly, casually, or lightly. With sincere conviction to plead with the Lord that he would give us hearts for the lost. And I think there's a dynamic of earnestly that reminds me that it's just a constant, this is not something we get broken for in one moment and we think it's gonna last our whole lives. It's a constant praying, God, give me your heart. Give me your heart for my neighbor. Give you my heart for my workplace. Give you, give me your, gosh, give me your heart. For Sri Lanka, give me your heart, even to the ends of the earth, to the remotest villages, to the tribes, where there's not one single person who loves you yet. And I've seen this, honestly, this this dynamic where it, it, 
It is about continually praying and asking the Lord for it. You know, in our own lives, um, I've shared different bits of our journey, but um, the first time I became aware of this reality of the unreached, I was actually part of, it was on my DTS with YWAM when I was 18. And, and I can remember talking to my DTS leader and saying, you know what, I just, I don't really have a heart for that part of the world. And um, I just, you know, I'm not, I'm... and she said to me, Claire, you need to show up in prayer and you need to start praying for this part of the world and watch what God does for you. And I remember he broke my heart. And then I went on this outreach to the Amazon, and, and I will never forget the joy of looking into the face of sharing the gospel with someone that's never heard the name of Jesus ever in their life, had no cultural existence of Christianity, the first time of sharing Jesus, and just watching the Holy Spirit fall, and just the pure joy that landed on this woman. So then I kept going through my life, you know, and I was called into missions, I was in a missions community, it was great. It didn't take very long for me to lose track of, like, why I was even there. Translate to 15 years later, at this point, I've got four children. Steve and I are living in the States. We've got this beautiful six-bed house, four acres of land, a truck, an SUV. We are living the American dream. We're running our businesses. We're serving at church like good Christians. Uh, <laughs> and we are, we're doing all the stuff. And I'll never forget it. There was, we went to this conference together and Steve and I, were just, we just instantly were sobbing as we listened to the reality of this world. And then and we came home and we were like, we should do something. We just got busy. And I'll never forget, I stood in the middle of our house and I was cleaning. And Trey was tiny and he was, he was obsessed with our Henry Hoover. I just distinctly remember this moment. No worship music playing, it's just me cleaning my house and the Lord grabbed me. And I remember he stood me in the middle of our house and he said, Claire, don't forget the one on the other side of the world. And he said, I, I want to know, will you give me even this? And I, I span around in a spot in our house. It was a dream to have all of this. And he said, am I worth it? Would you give it to me? Not, I'm not telling you you have to, but would you give it to me? And that moment radically shifted our trajectory as a family. What unfolded over a much longer story and many more parts they filled in. We ended up giving up our jobs, selling our home, and shifting our whole family of six, raising a whole team of church that prayed for us, that supported us, that walked with us as we journeyed to Warham Harbin. And why did we come to Warham Harbin? To invest in young people that were willing to go to the unreached, to give their yes for Jesus because that was the best place for us with the skills we had in our hand to serve in that way. But I had to fight to keep that heart piece to remember this reality. Why were we there? What was it really about? It was for the one in a tribe on the other side of the world that I didn't even get to go and visit. And recently, if I'm honest, the Lord has been breaking my heart again and convicting me and saying, Claire, you've stopped praying for the unreached. And he's been breaking my heart. And you know what I think the Lord is doing in this hour? He's saying, Claire, it no longer can be the job of a missionary to go to the unreached. It takes a whole church to engage, a whole church to have their hearts moved in compassion towards those who have no access to the gospel because it takes all of us, the whole global church, if we're going to see that map changed. And I feel the Lord birthing this repassion in me because I want to see a church mobilized. Guys, I want us to be mobilized even to the ends of the earth. And that does not mean that you all have to go to the ends of the earth because what you're doing in your workplace is sacred and what you're doing in your home, raising your children, is sacred. But some of you in this room, you're going to hear the Lord speak. And I want to cheer, lead you on to go. And I want us to be a church that gathers around those people and sends them out and says, we will not forget you. <sighs> Feeling the passion this morning. <laughs> but do you see it, church? Do you see why this takes all of us? And so as a church, as we in this hour have been reflecting on this reality, we know that we have to respond. And as we've just been praying about it, what does this look like for us? 
It is a real joy this morning to share with you that we are going to respond. <laughs> we are going to be launching a partnership moving forward with something called OMT Himalayas. <laughs> Most of you are like, OMT Himalayas, Claire, this makes no sense. What are you talking about? I'm like steaming up glasses here. I'm so passionate about what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> so for some context, we recognize, don't we, Verso, that the Bible is such a gift. It's the living, active word of God that breathes life to us. And so we know that as we look at the unreached, this plays a really key part in seeing them reached with the gospel. And so, and, and why, why Himalayas to start with? Himalayas, you might be like, where does that come from? Himalayas, can, the, Asia contains the most unreached people in the world, the most unreached people groups. And so we were drawn to look at that area, and we were drawn in discernment with Jesus, in discernment with community, in relationships that are naturally there. Some of you will remember Dylan, who was in our midst. He's in the Himalayas as a full-time missionary now. He's learning the language. He's giving his life. I chatted to him this week. But we're going to take our place in simply saying yes to do what we can do. And so what is OMT? OMT stands for Oral Mother Tongue. And it's a movement that's committed to ensuring every mother tongue on earth has the entire Bible in their language, the Bible that forms us, and we get to enjoy 10 different versions. We are looking to see it translated verse by verse into an oral mother tongue that does not have the Bible. And the oral part is really key. So some of you may not know, but a lot of these out, um, unreached groups now, they actually only communicate orally. They don't write things down. Everything is done just through oral communication. And so how will this unfold for us? What does it mean? So basically how it works is there's an OMT team in the Himalayas, which is a community of long-term missionaries who've gone there to live and give their lives to serve that region. And they will start to build relationships into an unreached people group, which by definition means there's less than 2% Christians present in their midst. And as they build relationship, and maybe one or two of them come to Jesus, they look to invest in their discipleship, um, of like one or two people, and as they walk with them and they, they go through a disciples training school and an ongoing process of being in community, they then start to teach those two or three people the process of orally translating the Bible into that mother tongue of that unreached people group. Now, traditionally, um, translation, as many of you will know, has taken about 30 years on average for one Bible in one language, and it costs millions over those 30 years. It's often looked like missionaries from different parts of the world moving into an unreached group or group, trying to learn a language from scratch, understand a culture and all of those things. And what they've actually discovered is that there's actually been some real errors in that. Because as you can imagine, if one of us moved to a tribal people, we don't understand the culture, we don't understand the word usage. And so when we attempt to translate using our Western mindsets into a completely different one, things go wrong. There was actually an example where they used the word heaven and heaven got translated as Buddha's heaven instead of the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> and so the OMT method looks to empower indigenous leaders who are the experts of their culture, their worldviews, their language use. But as they journey in the context of a community of worldwide theologians, people like Wycliffe are partnering with OMT, church leaders, they have this kind of community check back and forth as they start to translate orally onto an audio device. And basically, what they've discovered is that this process only takes two years to translate an entire Bible into an oral language, and at a grand total of about eight to 9,000 pounds total. And so as Verso, we are going to be stepping into a partnership and what we, I forgot to say this, but what we do love about this is it's not just about translating a Bible. OMT is a model that looks into the eyes of the multitude of unreached and goes, here's a group, the one, 
that need the Bible and investing in one person, two people, three people, translating the Bible as a tool in their hands, they are seeing long-term transformation of a community coming to Jesus, the unreached being reached with the good news of the gospel. And so as Verso, we are adopting an unreached people group. And I'm really, really excited to tell you this morning that the name of the unreached people group that we will be adopting is called, wait for it, (laughs) Kosh Rajbanshi Tribe. And they are in Nepal, in the southern plains of Nepal. Their name literally means of royal lineage. And they are a people group spread across South Asia. But in Nepal, they they are in the flatlands where it's subtropical. And, And the vast majority of people in this people group hold fast to their tribal animalistic beliefs. But there's a remnant, guys. There's a remnant. A few people that have come to know Jesus. And there is a church starting to grow in this people group. And we want to empower them with the whole Bible so that they can see radical discipleship breaking out. Yes, let's thank Jesus. And so as Verso, we're going to be financially covering the cost of those leaders' discipleship and the entire cost of translating that Bible. We're going to be committing in our times of prayer at places like Space and Breakthrough in different places to pray earnestly for people to fall in love with Jesus and to encounter him through the scriptures, that the Holy Spirit would fall on that tribe and that we'd see miracles and celebrate what God is doing. We're going to start praying earnestly for ourselves to keep being broken for the lost. And we're going to have the opportunity to go. Next year, we're going to take a team out to Nepal to serve alongside those long-term missionaries to go and meet this beautiful tribe made in the image of God. And we're going to get to go into the village and we're going to get to be part of distributing what we have been empowering to be translated on these little audio devices. And I think what really captured my heart was chatting to Jeremy, who we're going to hear from in a second. He was telling me a story and he said, um, I think it was Jeremy or Katerina, one of the two, they were telling me about a team, a US church that's doing the same, and they took out a team and for the group that they were sponsoring. And in this team, there were some 16-year-old boys who were on the team, and they had the story of the blind Bartimaeus on an audio device. And these boys were walking into the village, they were sitting next to people in the village, and they were playing this story of the blind Bartimaeus. Now, these boys can't speak the language. They're definitely not trained missionaries in the sense of like gone through a three-year training program. They've just given a yes to go to the end of the earth for Jesus. And as they pressed play on this audio, they were, they were playing it, and a couple of people were physically blind. And these boys laid their hands on them, and they were instantly healed, and their eyes were sight. I mean, that is crazy. And we want that in our midst. And I think there's something beautiful about partnering in this way, where we're going to get to experience something of what God is doing in the nations here. I want to see blind eyes healed in our midst. We have so much to learn from being in the nations. And so... To end here, we have a little tiny glimpse. They, they made a tiny video um, of that was uh, another church, just to kind of give you a sense of how this looks when they translate. And then we've got a video from Jeremy, who's on the OMT leadership team for the world, and he's a wire in Nepal. OMT works around the world, um, and he is going to pray for us here at Verso this morning. And then I'm going to invite Yasmin up, our young adults pastor who's going to lead us in praying for the people group that we are partnering with. And Yasmin has been to Nepal. She's been on the ground. She's encountered these places. And she carries something of the heart of what we want to see happen here at Verso. So let's watch these videos. 